Welcome to this getting started video for Dive Algebra 1 half through Calculus, the dive lectures that teach those Saxon curriculums. Let's go ahead and dive right in and start with the five steps to complete a lesson. Now when we talk about the five parts of a dive Saxon lesson, we're talking about part one, watching the dive lecture, and then two, the lesson practice, three, the problem set, four, grading the homework, and five, correcting the homework. The dive course, that's lectures, video lectures that teach the Saxon textbook, teach the lessons in the Saxon textbook. And so step one is to watch the lecture watch every lecture. It's important to understand that the Saxon textbook, the lesson in there is only a summary of the complete lesson and John Saxon himself, he recommended an experienced teacher to teach his courses. So in the dive lectures, that's what I do. I try to include the missing connections that are between the lessons, helping you see, oh, this lesson connected to that one and so on. That's really important in a course like Saxon where it's incremental, it builds in bite-sized pieces. And also my experience teaching this course, I kind of know where students struggle and I'll add additional instruction that's not in the textbook in those places. So don't think you have to read the book and watch the lecture. Watch the lecture. You can skip the textbook for now. Plus math is something that you do. It's not a passive thing to watch, but you see someone else do it in a video lecture. You see things come up line by line, number by number then you do them yourself, usually you connect with that idea a little faster than just passively reading. So that complete lesson is presented during the lecture, the complete lesson from the Saxon textbook. And a textbook lesson may have several parts, and you'll see them come up in bite-sized pieces, basically, in the video lecture. It's just a little less intimidating to look at one piece at a time instead of opening the textbook and seeing all those pages and numbers and letters everywhere. And again, there's additional instruction that you'll learn about that the textbook doesn't have. So the lecture, you'll watch that, you'll take brief notes. And so that means you want to include things like headings, like it's lesson 120, and subheadings, volume of a cylinder. But you don't have to write that whole thing out. You know, you can just do it short, volume, period, of cylinder and you know, shorthand is what that's called sometimes, abbreviated. You also want to include key points, just key ideas, problem solving tips that you hear or that you see come up. A word problem, for example, you don't have to write the whole sentence or sentences out for that again. Formulas, like this one here, you'd want to include things like that. And a great thing about the lecture, as opposed to being in a live class, is that you can pause and rewind it anytime you need to, to listen to something again. That's one of the beauties of having a lecture like this, is that you can go at your own pace. And again, you don't need to copy everything. I just want to emphasize that. Don't feel like you have to copy everything on the screen, especially if there's a word problem that comes up and you see a long list of words, a sentence or two sentences comes up. You don't have to copy all of that. You just need to solve the problem. So like I said, the main thing that you're doing is you're watching that lecture, listening and solving example problems. Math is best learned by doing so. We do math and, and we do that by solving example problems. Typically, they're labeled like A, B, C. Now, it's important to note that my example problems on the dive lecture, those are different than what Saxon has in the textbook that they also call example problems. They'll be similar because they're covering the same topic, but they're not identical. So you watch the lecture, you take notes, you do these first if you feel like you need extra practice, and you can also do the examples in the Saxon textbook. So to solve an example problem, what you want to do is pause the lecture and solve it in your notes. You have a page that you're taking notes in. You watch and listen, and then you pause that lecture, and you try to solve it on your own in your notes on your paper, learning by doing. If you don't understand something, pause and rewind until you get it, and then try to solve it. Don't copy it. You're not just watching things come up on the screen and just copying as you go and saying, yes, I'm finished. I've got this list of steps written on my paper. I don't know what I just did or what it's connected to or anything. So you want to avoid that. You don't just want to copy these down. You want to listen, pay attention, pause, 
solve it on your own, make sure you can get the same answer. Usually the answer is boxed and you can tell where it is. And so this problem, it had a formula with it. You substitute it into the formula the right way, solve it on your own. So summing up for part one, some things to be careful of. Don't read the text before watching the lecture. Most likely you're going to make the connections you need to easier by watching the lecture and just understand things quicker that way. So it's a, it's a good time saving step there. And another thing you want to avoid is looking at the Saxon text during the lecture. So you don't really need it out at all as you're doing the lecture. Your notes you want to be organized and you don't need to take too many notes, you know, copy everything that you see. You want to have that title, that subtitle, like we showed earlier. You want to do the example problems, write down key ideas, key problem solving tips. Those kinds of things will help you if you need to go back and look at your notes later and you're like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to just substitute right here or, you know, just different things. That writing of key ideas and things that helps you stay connected and engaged in the lesson without just overdoing your notes either. And finally, remember my example problems are different than the ones in the Saxon textbook that are titled example problems. John Saxon recommended teaching this way and we also wanted to do it to give you an extra set of example problems in case you needed that, which you probably won't. After you finish the lecture, you're ready for part two, the lesson practice. The lesson practice is designed to build mastery of the new concept doesn't mean perfection. Don't expect to get every single question right the first try on all of your homework from here on out, but you're building on mastery as you do a lecture and then the lesson practice. The lesson practice is found in the student textbook and it'll be titled lowercase practice and three to five problems typically. Do all of those problems. Math is deductive in nature, meaning it's rules-based. There's rules, there's concepts that apply in lots of different situations. So you learn the rules, you figure out those concepts, and then you do the practice, which is not going to be exactly like the example problems you just did on the lecture, but it'll be similar, and you should be able to recognize those similarities, solve these new problems based on what you just learned. If not, rewatch the dive lecture as you need to. Find a similar example, see how it was solved, then try the practice again. And the answers to the practice set problems are in your solutions manual. After the lesson practice, you're ready for part three, the problem set. And the problem sets, they're also in the student textbook and you'll see that title. They're usually immediately beneath the practice and You'll see the lesson number there next to it. For example, this one is from lesson eight, problem set eight. And the problem set, it contains problems from all the previous lessons. And depending on the problem set, it may not have every single lesson in there, but overall, as you move through them, you're going to be reviewing all the previous lessons. John Saxon called this continual review. And it's different than something called the spiral method. Sometimes it's confused with that. Let's take a closer look at what this continual review method is. And what happens is a new bite-sized concept is introduced. And then that concept is practiced in the mixed practice, also referred to as the problem set, over several lessons. And so you have some practice for several lessons. And then another step is added to that concept, and so you're building. Think of it like learning a language. You learn the alphabet, you learn some small words, you learn some nouns, you learn some verbs, you start to put those into sentence combinations. Then you learn more complex things. You're still using the more fundamental things, but and the new things build off of the more fundamental, easier things. But you don't learn everything at once either, right? You build on it for a while, practice it for a while, build on something new, practice that some more in your problem sets, and then you build on that some more, and you just go through that process. The only spiral-like method to Saxon is that, for example, if you just finished Algebra 1, then you start Algebra 2, you're going to see 
that that reviews what you learned in Algebra 1, you need to go back and review things you've already learned. That's more of what a spiral is. And there's a place for that, and Saxon puts it in exactly the right place. But then the majority of the course has this continual review method. So those problem sets, they're designed to build long-term retention. And until that's built, concepts are often forgotten. And that's why if you look at a problem set, you'll see those little numbers in parentheses underneath a problem number. And so like this five that we kind of magnified there. And that means, you know, this is problem set eight but there's a problem there from lesson five. If you forgot how to do that type of problem, then you know where you need to go to review. And you can go back and you can watch the dive lecture again. You can fast forward it to a similar example. So this is much, much better for learning than running to the answer key or the solutions manual to look at what the answer is. What you're trying to do in true learning is, is learn that concept and how to apply it in a new situation. So you go back and review that particular concept. Look for those similarities between what you learned in that lecture and what you're seeing now in this new problem set problem. Make those connections. In my teaching experience, one thing I've found is that after watching that dive lecture again, if, for a student who's forgotten something, they can usually solve the problem. If you can't solve it, mark it wrong, move on to the next problem. Don't spend 10, 20 minutes stuck on it. The next two steps involve grading and correcting. And so step four, grading. Parents, you're going to use the solutions manual to mark incorrect answers. And so you're just marking them wrong with an X if they're wrong. Now. For mature students, and most students, once they're getting into Algebra 1, Algebra 2, they should be mature enough to be able to use the answer key and just mark their own problems wrong. So those students will use the answer key provided in the Saxon Homeschool packet. And that's not a solutions manual, it's just the answers. And for those problems you got wrong, you just mark those with an X. And then you move on to step five on correcting those mistakes. And there's steps in the student instruction sheet, and those show you how to relearn, correct missed problems. Now, after seeing the correct answer, sometimes students can find their mistakes without using any other resources, including solutions manuals. So if that answer key didn't help, you can watch the dive lecture again because you have that lesson reference there. It tells you what lesson that problem came from. If that doesn't help, that's when you get the solutions manual out. And the solutions manual, like you see over here to the right, that provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve a problem. It's important that students don't just write correct answers down. Solve all missed problems on your paper next to the problem that you did or start a new page called corrections and solve those problems again even ones from the solutions manual you've seen the steps here but put that effort into closing the solutions manual and then go try to solve it again now that you've seen those steps that you need to do it and that's how you're gonna learn your math not by just writing steps down and copying them from the solutions manual that's doesn't do any good study how it's solved in the solutions manual then go try to solve it on your own and then your very last resort would be to email me send me a digital photo of your handwritten work or tell me I don't understand after step one so from here here on I don't understand those steps so that way we're both at least looking at the same part of the solutions manual or ideally you send me a digital photo of your handwritten work on that problem and I can usually pinpoint what your mistake was and just most effectively help you on what your trouble spot is on that question. Now here's some time saving tips. So first one here, don't get stuck on a problem more than 10 minutes as you're doing your mixed practice. Remember, it's called practice. And think about going to baseball practice. You have that just for a certain amount of time each day. You're going to have baseball practice again another day. So if you don't pick up on a particular concept that day, you'll do it again. So 
Same with math. Don't get stuck on a problem more than 10 minutes. And make sure when you are grading your work, or even before that, you, you know you don't want that solutions manual out while you're completing your mixed practice set. And you want to follow our student practice instructions as you're doing your grading and correcting. You want to look at that solution, then close the manual, try to solve it on your own now. And not just copy letter by letter. And parents, again, don't help the student until after all the steps on the student instruction sheet are completed. Remember, you can find that student instruction sheet in the teacher's guide. Now, another important part of your Saxon Dive course are the Saxon tests, and there's a small booklet that you can find in your homeschool packet titled Test Forms. You can see that circled red there in the top corner. On your student instruction sheet found in your teacher's guide, there's some instructions on doing your test, so see that. And you have a time limit that you'll want to do of one hour. And also at the top of every single test, what does it say there? Show your work. So you want to do these on a separate piece of paper because most of the time there's just not enough room on the test itself to show your work. We recommend studying for 10 to 15 minutes or more by working a few practice problems from each lesson the test covers. For the first several tests, maybe through test six or so, you don't need to be so concerned about the time limit, but after test six or so, that one hour time limit is recommended. And we do also recommend parent supervision on that. Mark incorrect answers using the Saxon Solutions Manual or answer key depends on which course you're doing as to where those test answers are. So like we talked about earlier, and parents should grade this for sure. We, we said you can have a parent grade or not the problem sets. But just mark missed problems with an X. Students correct those problems without using any other resources. And that means reworking that problem, solving it. If you can solve it correctly, then add half credit to their grade on that particular problem. And that's just a reward for putting in that effort to figure out what you did wrong, think it through, try it again. Now for those problems where you still just can't get it right, then watch the corresponding dive lecture solve some similar problems in the lesson practice for that lesson. And then again, you can use me as a last resort there if the solutions manual doesn't help, watching the lecture again doesn't help, and so on. Now, as you do your math during the week, we don't recommend trying to cram one lesson. Remember those five parts we talked about? That is what we mean by one lesson. You don't have to cram that into one sitting and one day. What we recommend instead is what we refer to as the timed method. And work on your math a minimum of four to five days per week. Strong math students, four days. Weak or reluctant math students, five days. And work on math no more than one to two hours per day. Now, for, for younger students, most likely who would be doing algebra half, one and two, one to one and a half hours per day advanced math, which is pre-calculus, and calculus, 1.5 to 2 hours per day. These aren't rules, these are recommendations here, and after that amount of time is completed and the whole lesson isn't completed, that's okay. Stop, pick up the next day. Well, last, just wanted to talk briefly about the teacher's guide, and you can find that at diveintomath.com forward slash dive tg and go there, open that teacher's guide, read through that, especially print out those student instructions, and we've been talking about those some throughout this getting started as well. Read through that teacher's guide for more detailed information on doing your course to the best of your ability. And that's all for this getting started. God bless, and I hope you have a great year.